Hi, friends. How many of you know that God can make a way? Yes, he can. That's awesome. Hey, while, while we're applauding, can we just, this is great. We get to do this together at all of our campuses. Can we just give a genuine and warm welcome to everyone at all the other campuses and just say hey? Glad you're with us, everybody. And if you're joining us online, glad you're with us. My name is Ben, one of the pastors here. Probably my favorite Christmas movie is A Christmas Story. Anybody else love that one? I love it. It's like the whole life through the eyes and experiences of a young kid, and it's narrated with that old guy's voice, and it's just all the learning you do growing up. One of my favorite scenes happens on uh, uh, the playground at recess when a kid named Flick doesn't believe that if you stick your tongue to a flagpole, it will stick. You know the scene I'm talking about? Check it out. You're full of beans and so's your old man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Says who? Says me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I double dare you. The exact exchange and nuance of phrase in this ritual is very important. Huh. Are you kidding? Stick my tongue to that stupid pole that's dumb. That's because you know it'll stick. You're full of it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I double dog dare you. Now it was serious. A double dog dare. What else was left but a triple dare you? And finally, the coup de grace of all dares, the sinister triple really dog dumb. dare. I triple dog dare you. Hmm. Schwartz created a slight breach of etiquette by skipping the triple dare and going right for the throat. All right, all right. Spine stiffened, his lips curled in a defiant sneer. There was no going back now. This is next. Where's Flick? <laughs> you remember the triple dog dare? That's a classic. It's a very useful tool. You pull it out when, when, when you want to kind of call someone out a little bit. When you are absolutely sure of something and they don't believe you, you can say, look, I'm not just blowing smoke. I know what I'm talking about. I'm absolutely confident on this. I triple dog dare you. That's when you use it. We're in a series right now. We're calling Take the Dare. So Take the Dare has become a kind of useful way for us to think about our life with God. And all of the sort of elements that go with really trusting God. You know, when, when God is the one saying to you, I dare you, I triple dog dare you, you don't have to be afraid that you're going to get stuck somewhere where you don't want to be. Instead, trusting God is the only thing that will lead us out of the kind of safe, tame, predictable, harmless comfortable Christian lives that we can sometimes lead. Trusting God is the thing that can get you into the arena where you're finally like having some daring faith, some radical trust, and a spiritual breakthrough, and you never get there if you don't take the dare. And so we've been kind of helping each other over the last few weeks think about those areas 
in our life and some key habits that go with them. And actually, they kind of fall into the letters D-A-R-E. We took them in reverse order. So E stands for encounter the living God, like have a fresh encounter with Christ. And the takeaway here, the dare is that, we would, that you would get in a group and that you would get some scripture intake in your life four times a week. I hope you're taking that dare. Scripture, four times a week, all right? It'll change your life. And then R, last week we talked about, means to reach out to someone, like someone who doesn't know God, and see how God might open a door for you to have conversation or make an invitation. And the, and the takeaway here, the dare is to pray for one. Every day, pray, God, just show me one person to share your love with. I, I hope you're taking that dare. And then you can talk about asking God what to give to God. Because there's nothing that shows our trust in God like our finances do. And then all the way back up to D stands for do something that really matters. And we're going to talk next week about ministry and serving somehow that really adds up for kingdom value. Today, we're going to, we're going to simply talk about this idea of what it would look like for you and me and everyone to, to ask God. What do you want me to give to you in 2020? It's a very reasonable question that you would ask God, what do you want me uh, to give? And I, and I hope that every single person, old, young, you know, you got a lot of money, you got no money, you're single, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a kid, whatever, that everyone would, would go through this spiritual exercise of asking God. Because it turns out that, you know, if if we really do this, we're in for a surprise. Because I think a lot of people, if, if you ask God, you know, what, what to give, I, I think we feel like we're going to, I don't know, get in trouble or we're going to get stuck like flick somewhere. Whenever we start talking about money, uh, it just gets to be very uncomfortable with a lot of people. You know, it's just a tough topic to talk about. We get some negative vibes going or people get defensive or they get even angry sometimes or skeptical or feel guilty maybe about it all or whatever. But here's the deal. Just like Flick found out, when you ask God, what you're in for is a surprise. It's not what you thought. Because when you ask God and then you just trust God, well, it turns out to be a source of joy and peace, not all that icky stuff. It, it, you, you, you find the happiness that comes from obedience. You find the thrill that comes with generosity and the kickback you get when you do something like that. You, you get the, all the feels that come from helping others. You, you get the spiritual boost that comes from honoring God and getting your life spiritually aligned with God's will. All of that comes. So in short, it's not what most people think. And when you ask God what to give, it's way better than you expect. If you don't, ask, don't believe me, Ask Jesus. He's the one who said in Acts 20, 35, trust me, I know it's not what you think this way, but it's better to give than receive. And we're like, what? That sounds backwards. He's like, trust me. And in fact, he goes on to dare us. I don't, I don't uh, have any illusions about this. I suspect this is maybe the most difficult one of the D-A-R-E challenges any of us will face. It's one of the hardest, I think. I mean, we may have an easier time praying for someone or reading our scriptures or, than, we, than we would in this area in terms of hopping the fence with our finances and God. And I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus talks about it so much because he knows it's a challenge for us and also because he knows how much it means to him and to us. Uh, you know, giving to God financially is the sort of one sort of real barometer of my spiritual authenticity that I can't fake. I can tell you whatever I want to tell you about my spiritual life, and I can pray and preach sermons all day long, but until you pony up, Jesus kind of wants to know, put your money where your mouth is in terms of your faith, and when you offer God finances, it's the one that you can't fake, and so I think that's why he talks and teaches so much about it, because he doesn't need your money, but he does want you. He wants your heart, and he knows that our treasure and our heart are linked and so that's why this becomes such an important spiritual breakthrough area for us. So if you, you know, my prayer is that everyone, and I mean everyone who calls Mountain Home, would have a legitimate experience of just asking God, what do you want me to give to you in 2020? Okay? And as you do that, um, I think there are some things we can help each other with today that will kind of aim us in, in the right direction because God's kind of already spoken to us through his word on some things that'll get us aimed in the right direction. Then you're going to have to listen in prayer for kind of more specifics, obviously. But here's some things. 
If you ask God, what do you want me to give to you? I think one of the things he's going to say to all of us, each of us, first of all, he's going to say, I hope you will give so I'm first. I think that's what God would say to us. I hope you will give. Whatever you decide to do with God and your giving in 2020, I hope you'll do it in a way that would reflect that I'm first. Like I'm first in your life. Like, and, and, and I get your first gift. Like before you give to everything else and I, and I just get leftovers. Like, like before you spend for entertainment and trips and nights out and extra treats on vacation. And even before home improvements, put me first. Like even before mortgage check and grocery bills and tuition payments, like I want to know where do I rank with you? Put me first. You know, God asked for this all over in the Bible. And um, so if you look back on 2019 and God were going to draw a conclusion about where he ranks with you based on what you gave to him in 2019, what would he conclude? It's like a, a kind of great question. So that's the first thing. Ask God what to give. He's probably going to say something like, give in a way that shows I'm first. Second, he would probably say this. He'd probably say, give so you feel it. Give so I'm first, but give so you feel it. Like, like it's a gift that kind of, you feel it when you give it. That it's not just something extra that you won't miss, but that somehow it, it represents some measure of sacrifice, right? I'll show you a picture here, a heartwarming example of generosity here. This Chinese businessman posted this picture, um, and he said, you know, true happiness is not found in material things, and helping children find their happiness is truly more valuable than possessions, he said. This $400,000 Lamborghini is nothing compared to the joy of these children, so I am allowing these kids to jump and play all over this expensive car. And the beauty of the story, of course, is that the kids aren't his, and neither is the Lamborghini. So <laughs> it's pretty easy to be generous with someone else's stuff, isn't it? I have no problem giving your time away. I have no problem letting kids play on your Lamborghini, okay? But what God wants to know is, you know, are you willing to sacrifice something, you know, for me? Something that you believe is valuable to show where our relationship is with God. This is what happened with Abraham in the Old Testament, right? Unbelievably, God wants to know if Abraham is ready and really faithful and true. And so he, he asks this unthinkable thing, Abraham, would you sacrifice your most prized possession for me? Which in that case is his only son, Isaac. And I got a lot of questions about that. But here's the thing. Abraham is ready to do it. Now, God stops him, and it never happens, but he wanted to know. And I think God wants to know, Ben, how much do you love me? And I can say all day long, oh, God, I love you a lot. But you know what? I love my money. I love, my, I, love my, I love what money can do for me. I love what I can do for my family with money. I love the, look, I love the feel of it in my wallet. I love the look of it on my bank page, and so do you. Right? And God wants to know. And then we say, oh, God, I love you. And he wants to know, yeah, so how, I'm trying to think of a way you could show that to me. That's real. <laughs> Sacrifice is when you give up something you love for something you love more. And I think God wants to know if you love him like that. And this is why all through the scripture we see this idea of giving in a sacrificial way to God. This is what was going on in David's mind. He was, he was so thankful to God one day. He was just so intent on making a worship offering to God. And someone was like, I'm with you 100%, David, and wanted to give him a bunch of stuff that he could offer to God. And David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, he said, no way. I am gonna, I'm not taking that as a gift. I'm going to pay you for it because I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And so... When we think of the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us, like giving his whole life, it doesn't really make sense to worship a God like that with leftovers or something that we don't feel and that doesn't cost us anything. It's easy to say the words, I love you, Lord, and sing the songs, but he wants to know if we're ready to pony up. And so as you prayerfully consider this very reasonable question, God, what would you want me to give to you in 2020? I think you're going to hear some of these kind of things come back from God. Like, give so I'm first and give so you feel it. And the third thing I think he'll say is, give me the tithe. That's what he's going to say. He's going to say, give me the tithe. That's clear from his word. What is a tithe? A tithe simply means a tenth. It's a tenth. 
And you see it all over in the Bible, like it begins very early in the Bible, like on the first few pages of Scripture, we find a guy like Abram, who is, who's been given this wonderful moment in his life and a victory, and he knows God was a part of that. And so this instinctual, voluntary response comes out of Abram, and it says in Genesis 14, 20, that he, he, he's so mindful of God that he gives him a tenth of everything. There's your tithe. It wasn't commanded. It was just a human instinct. When you're grateful and you want to acknowledge God for his provision, his protection, his deliverance, it's in the human DNA to reflect it somehow, and the tithe is tied to that. You see it again with Jacob in Genesis 28, verse 22. He's had one of these awesome experiences with God, and God showed up in a special way to him, and he just says, I never want to forget this moment. I'm going to mark this moment. He sets up a stone in the middle of the road, and what does he do to offer God? He also says, and God, of all that you have given me, I want to give you a tenth. And so there's the principle of the tithe. And so this does not make sense to you If you forget the most basic truth of the Bible, which is that God owns it all. God owns everything. If you forget that, this is all nonsense to you. But if you remember that everything, including everything we possess, is God's to begin with, then this feels like not a great oppression for us, but a sort of opportunity to reflect our knowledge that all comes from God. And you're saying, well, I, I worked hard for my money. I, 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 you know, I, I did all, it's like, come on, seriously. First Corinthians 4, 7 reminds us, what do you even have that God didn't give you? I mean, even the ability to produce your wealth is given by God. It's all a gift. And so no wonder that this idea of a tithe, this tenth, becomes the regular worship practice of God's people throughout the whole history of the Bible, an instinctive response, and then eventually it becomes like instituted as a stipulation. It becomes a sort of command of God in the Old Testament because it's like we always want to remember this. We always want to do this stuff. And so you find lots of places in the Bible where it's just straight up like commanded for God's people, like Leviticus 27, which says, a tithe of the produce of the land, that was their means of income, was their produce, or whether grain of the fields or fruit from the trees, but whatever, whatever income you have, a tenth belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. Every tenth animal, if that's what you do, you raise animals, then that, that, that should be given over to the Lord. It all belongs uh, to God. You probably maybe heard about the woman. She was at the airport, and uh, she's waiting for her plane. She goes and buys one of those little snack packages of Oreo cookies, like 10 in a pack or something, and she, she, she sits down, and uh, this other gentleman comes and sits in the chair on the uh, other side. There's a little table between them, and there's the, the package of Oreos there sitting between them. And she's sitting there reading a book, getting ready, you know, to board her plane, and this guy sitting there reaches over, picks up the Oreos, opens the package, and takes out an Oreo and eats it himself. She's like, I, the gall of this guy. How, I, she can't hardly believe it. So she reaches down just to kind of mark her territory, you know, grabs one out of there, rustles it, so he looks at her. They lock eyes. It's kind of awkward, and he just smiles and nods. She eats her cookie. She can't hardly believe it. Well, then he does it again. He reaches over and takes another cookie out of the package of Oreos. He's eating it, and she's like looking at him like, the, the audacity of this guy. She grabs another cookie to have like a little Oreo war going on until they're down to the last cookie, and the guy reaches in, takes the last cookie, breaks it in half, and gives her half, eats it, waves at her, and walks away. She's, she's just fuming. She can't believe this guy. She, time to get on her plane, she grabs her purse and gets on the plane, sits down, and there her purse falls open, and she sees her unopened package of Oreos, (laughs) because she was eating his Oreos the whole time, (laughs) mad at him for wanting any. Isn't that how we are? God owns all the Oreos. They're all his cookies. We get so offended if God, he gives us a 10-pack, and he wants one back, and we're like, how dare he? But when you remember that they all belong to God to begin with, it's a whole different story, isn't it? And so one time in the Old Testament, God's people had kind of gotten off track. You know how we do sometimes. And God wants to call them back to himself. And so he sends a prophet, a messenger, as he often does, someone into our lives, to get word to them. And and you you can look at it. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, the prophet comes with this word from God saying, Return to me, and I will return to you. Return to me. You know, people now, they're, they're kind of caught off guard because they're just cruising along. They don't even know they're off track. They're like, what? What are you talking about? How, how are we to return? I mean, we're, I thought we were good. 
I'm going to the temple every t- all the time. You know, what's the problem here? And the answer is surprising. God says, God says, you're mere mortals, and yet you're robbing me. You're robbing God. And they're shocked. They're like, what? What are you talking about? How are we robbing you? And the answer comes in verses 8 through 10. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. God gives the answers. Well, the tithes and the offerings, remember that? When you were going to put me first, but you're eating all the Oreos. The tithes and the offering. You have all these bad things that are happening in your life, in your nation right now. And and it starts here with getting right with me. And then he says, here's the answer, verse 10. Here's what you do. God says, bring the whole tithe. Bring the tenth into the storehouse. And then God says words he doesn't say anywhere else in the Bible. He says, test me in this. Test me says the Lord God Almighty. And you just see, if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you won't even know what to do with it. Just you see. And there it is. Do you see it? Test me, test me. God says, I triple dog dare you. It's right there in the Bible. He's like calling us out. Calling our bluff. We can say this, we can say that. Ah, oh, you're full of baloney. It doesn't work. Blah, 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 blah. But God puts his own reputation on the line. He says, you can trust me. I'll make a deal with you. Just you try this. And you know what? If you're not glad about it and you don't receive some kind of spiritual blessing in your life, if you don't see something happen that way, then I'm not God and you can do whatever you want to do. But before you blow me off, and before you listen to all the chatter of all the cynics out there, try me. Test me in this. I triple dog dare you. So it becomes a moment of truth for each of us, really. Like whatever whatever comes in, God says a tenth. What do you think? Test me. And it'll keep accounts straight. It's usually a bad idea when someone triple dog dares you to do something. It's usually a bad idea to do it. Unless the one triple dog daring you is God. And then it's a bad idea not to. So I dare you, as you think about a planned approach, instead of a one-off or a whim or a feeling in a moment or whatever you happen to have in your pocket for God, I dare you to think about it and plan it. In fact, on the seat that you have, uh, where you are right there, there was one of these cards. Go ahead and pick it up and look at it for a second if you would. It says, take the dare. It's a simple tool. All it is is a card where you can put your name, and I'm just going to ask you to take this home and think about it, pray about it. I'm asking everyone who calls Mountain Home to take the dare, to go home and to think about this very reasonable question, like, God, what do you want me to give to you through Mountain in 2020? There's something powerful about asking God and listening for an answer, and then writing your name on a card and a number that you've thought and prayed, maybe talked to a spouse about or whatever. And if you write the number that God is leading you to write, it's going to be okay. It's going to be the right number. And I encourage you to do that. Bring it back in a couple weeks. You know, when you, when you give in these sorts of ways, where you give where it kind of shows God's first for you and that you feel it and you're thinking of wrestling with this idea of the tithe and giving in that way, it does three things. One, number one, it honors God. It honors God. It shows him you're willing to obey, you're ready to trust him, and blesses him and honors God. Number two, it'll help you. When we give in these ways, it, you know what, it kind of beats the pig down in us. It it raises our character and gives us that satisfaction that we're aligned with God. But here's the third thing it does. It does God's work. It accomplishes God's work. It's a very practical takeaway, but it's true. When God's people give, it does God's work. Now, we need to be able to grow in our giving because of the spiritual growth element. But you know what? When we give today, like to God through a place like mountain, we're not just slitting the neck of some lamb and the blood dribbles down the altar. No, no, no. Those gifts get put into play for God's work in super meaningful ways. It really does matter. It's always been this way. In the Old Testament, when, when you know, God's work wanted to go forward through the temple and the caring for the poor and all that, it depended on the giving of God's people. Same in the New Testament, when they wanted to extend the compassion of Christ, when the church wanted to to get the good news of Jesus out, it depended on the generosity of God's people. It's the same way today. You know, Mountain, we have have ministry that we want to do together, but it depends on our ministry. And, And you know what? 
It depends on our giving. And you know what? Uh, we, we've been kind of challenged by God, we believe, to dare to dream a little around here. We're, we're not just trying to, you know, bump along and do business as usual as a church. We're, we're trying to dare to dream some big dreams. And one of the huge things is we're going to try to launch a campus in Aberdeen in 2020. And it's a big step for us, but by golly, it's a God-sized dream, and we believe with God-sized generosity, we're going to be just fine. But it's going to take God's people stepping up, and that's you. So that's why I'm hoping you ask God, what do you want me to give? And again, our goal is 100%, take the card home, prayerfully consider it, talk about it, wrestle with it, and come back and come ready, and then hop the fence. I dare you. Now, I want to be real honest here for a little bit and just kind of talk frankly about a couple things because I think it might help some of you. I think a lot of us struggle whenever we start talking about this. You start talking about, man, a commitment, you know, to, to, to God for the year, and I don't know, there's a lot of things I can't control, and all, we get all kind of wigged out. I tell you, one of the reasons that we struggle is that sometimes our own personal finances are maybe in, in a bit of a mess. Maybe we're in debt over our eyeballs, or when we start talking about generosity, we don't feel like we can because of our own financial situation, where, you know, and it makes us feel sad or angry, or maybe it was not our fault, or maybe some bad decisions we made, whatever. If, if that kind of resonates with you, I want to just make sure you know about something called Financial Peace University. It's a course we offer here at Mountain, and it's awesome. Helps you kind of get your arms around your finances, how to manage them, how to handle them, how to save, how to get rid of some debt. You know that we had 99 people go through this last year at Mountain, and do you realize that just by, in the time of that class, in the weeks of that class, $662,000 of non-mortgage debt was paid off. That's awesome. And then we had another $211,000 that the whole class put together and, and saved in, in their own individual savings account in cash. And about 400 some credit cards were snipped up and thrown away because they were causing trouble. You got to put them in their place. So if that sounds like it might be interesting and helpful to you, you saw where you can sign up for that or just go to the website for FPU, Financial Peace University. I know some of us struggle. And that, sometimes we struggle for other reasons, though. It's not that your own financial management is in question. Maybe you're just not sure, you know, maybe you're new here and you don't know if you can trust this church to do, you know, handle it right or something like that. Or maybe you're just cynical or you've seen some of those phony TV preachers that beg for money and then they fly off in a Learjet or you saw some program on TV and it looks so compelling and then later you, you see something on, on the news about how they were, it was all a sham and the money didn't go where you thought it was going to go and we, get, we can get real cynical and protective. And this interesting thing is, you know, the Bible actually supports that thinking and reminds us, listen, every dime you have was given to you by God and so you need to be a good steward. So be generous, but don't be stupid. Only invest it where you're sure it's got a good return. That's what God wants us to do. So it's okay to be cynical to a point where you're, you're measuring the ROI. You know, that stands for return on investment. So when you give to God through a place like Mountain, you're make, you got to think of it as an investment. You're not throwing something away. You're investing. And what's the return on that investment? You need to ask that question, and I hope you do. Because when you do, you're going to see why I'm so confident about standing up here and saying, trust God, because this is going to make such a huge kingdom impact. You can trust the investment. You can trust the accountability. Let me just talk real frankly with some of you, because I think it'll help some of you. Mountain is scrupulous and careful. We're not wasters. We're not frivolous with what we do with every dime that comes in. Uh, Every year, we're audited by an external firm. And uh, to make sure everything's proper and above board and transparent, and we always pass with flying colors every single time. We never have done anything otherwise. In addition to that, we voluntarily submit to the most scrupulous standards of fiscal responsibility and have received the ECFA seal of approval every single year. It stands for Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. And when you see that little sign on some organization, it means they're in compliance with the highest standards, their books have been checked, everything's looked at, so they're accountable and they're transparent, and it means you can trust them. I want you to know that. Not because all of you need to know, because some of you don't care, you already know, but some of you, I don't want you to be listening to all the chatter of the enemy or some cynic in your head that will prevent you from the breakthrough you can have if you will ask God, what do you want me to give? 
and then listen for his answer. And that's why I'm telling you this. And just to tell you straight up, Carla and I, we tithe to Mountain Christian Church, and we give a beyond that to mountain. I tell you that not to brag. I just want you to know we're, I'm, I'm smoking what I'm selling here, okay? I, I, I'm not just up here preaching a sermon to you. I believe in this to my core, and we give to other places too, but mountain is a ministry portfolio that's such a great investment, I'm telling you. So, do you, do you care about kids? Do you think it might be a good idea to invest spiritually and plant seeds in kids today so that tomorrow they can lead the world in a different way? If you care about that, write a check to Mountain because that's what we do here. We do kids. Do you care about students? Think it might be important, anybody, to sort of get kids on a spiritual path while they're in middle school and high school and help them get grounded in their faith? Anybody think that's a good idea? That's what we do, see? So you think about the things you care about. Do you care about local compassion? You know what? Do you care about homelessness? Do you care about domestic abuse, Habitat for Humanity, or shelters, or uh, Welcome One, or partnering with schools, or Boys and Girls Club, or Extreme Family Outreach, on and on? You want to start any new churches? All of that. Mountain does all of that. We're a church we're the, we're, Jesus says we're the hope of the world. We, we give a gift to Mountain, provides mission work all over the world. We're in Myanmar and Germany and Australia and Maasai land and Kenya and, and, and Tanzania and Romania and Indonesia and Mexico and Brazil and China and Southeast Asia and Thailand and on and on and on, Fellowship of Christian Athletes locally. In addition to all that, the generosity of Mountain, look at this, $1.4 million comes right through, doesn't even go to Mountain at all, goes to children around the world through child sponsorship every single year because we believe in kids and generosity. And that's not even mentioning the epicenter. The epicenter is part of our Edgewood campus now, but it's, listen, it's going to be at Aberdeen. Just look at last year, the epicenter and what it does. Just as you think about youth, every day over 100 kids in the zone. And we're going to have over 400 kids in Camp Epic when we get Aberdeen going. Just think about that. Or health and wellness. Just for example, Mountain Together, all campuses and epicenter combined gave away 250,000 pounds of free food last year to people who need it. And we gave away 529 hot showers provided for people who are transitioning out of homelessness. Those things are important. How about life skills? 700 people received life skill training to get back on the track toward employment. 112 records were expunged. And what about recovery? 112 people are on the road to recovery through AA and NA through the epicenter. So that's what you're investing in. The results are clear the rewards are eternal. If you just put up a pie chart of every of, of mountain giving, that's what it looks like. It's like all the stuff we just talked about is in there. You see leadership development, interns, and pastoral preparation for future ministers. You got computer systems to track discipleship, and you've got office and printing materials and websites so our resources get out. You've got global and local impact. We keep our debt manageable so we can leverage it for kingdom use. We have a bajillion services every single year. We got kids and students uh, meeting in, in all kinds of places and meeting spaces and all of that, that's your ROI. And now, on top of all that, God's calling us to launch a new campus in Aberdeen. So are you kind of curious how it's going up there? Are you? Okay, hello. Well, that's okay, I got a video for you, watch this. Hey, what's up, Mountain? I'm standing here in front of the Aberdeen campus. I thought, you know what, I want to give everybody a little bit of an update, let you see the progress, what's going on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you around, take you for a quick tour. Okay, let me show you around.
All right, so there you go. A little bit of a sneak peek. You start to see the rooms come to life, right? The kid spaces. Uh, now we got to put down some floors, paint the walls, start to get the furnishings, TVs for the walls, uh, rockers for the nursery, all the stuff you can imagine that we need for the church. The epicenter is going to start to come in. Phase one is going to be complete before you know it. All right, so it's happening. It's happening. So as you can see, the shell is up. We got a lot of finished work to do, and we got to pay for it. And then we got to do phase two, which is going to be that uh, area next to it, which will be the worship area and the gymnasium. So yeah, there's a long, long way to go yet. Um, last year, just to put it in brass tacks, since a few have asked, last year we had $10.2 million that you saw invested in the ways that we just described moments ago. So this year, you know, to do Aberdeen, that number needs to be more like 13.8. So 10.2 to 3.8 is a pretty God-sized stretch. It's well within the capacity of Mountain to do this, but it's going to take all of us kind of realizing, is this a good investment? Absolutely it is. You bet your bottom dollar. And how do you, how do you quantify some of this stuff anyway? Like when you really want to measure the investment and the return. I mean, how do you put... What is a human soul spending eternity with Jesus worth? I mean, really, I mean, that's a friend of yours whose life is in Christ now and on a different path, you know? A kid who comes to know the Lord, an addict who gets set free, a marriage that gets rescued, someone who's suicidal who now is like got hope in Christ. I don't know how you add value or what you know how to, how to quantify that, but I know Jesus gave his life for that. That's what Jesus died for. And now he says, I want you to give toward that mission in a way that reflects some of the same kind of passion. So we're just asking everybody, take this card home, pray about it. Listen, and then do what God tells you. And then when we come back, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 describes it. Every person, like I mean everyone, Everyone then should then just give as they, after you talk to God, after you've decided in your heart. Not reluctantly, it's like, oh, I gotta pay this bill. Not under compulsion, oh, Ben's making me. But just because God loves a cheerful giver and you're ready to do that. You know, each week we've been showing you a video of um, some friends who went in on the Abingdon campus and I asked them to reflect on the same question about take the dare and I wanna give them the last word today. Watch the screen one more time. I want to hear you talk about the sort of giving thing for you, like putting God absolutely first in your life, in your, gen in your generosity. It's not easy to talk about, but we probably need to talk about it more. Are you ready for that? We're going to ask everyone in the church to take the dare financially. I don't care who, you don't get off the hook because you're 14. Like, what does that look like for you, you know? I knew it was a no-brainer for me. I'm like, you know what, we're blessed, and yeah. this, is, yeah. this is not um, by chance or by any of our doing. And, you know, it's time to pay attention because um, we've been given way too many opportunities. And I, after coming here to Abingdon, I said, we're not going to mess this one up, this opportunity up. So um, God is growing on us to, to be more generous um, and putting us in situations to be more generous as well. And it's a process. I mean, uh, God is putting our finances in alignment. Right. And that's why uh, we were driving home. My wife says, okay, pray to God in peace so he could put in your heart. How much we need to give. Yeah, that, that question, what is God calling us to do, I think is very important, right, for us to wrestle with yeah. as individuals and as, as a married couple. Part of the reason we give is, is obedience. I mean, in, in the scriptures, it specifically says, you know, uh, to bring in the full tithe into the church and. First fruits. Yeah, the first fruits, you know, and it seems that that does a lot of different things in us uh, and helps with our character and our. Um, helps us not hold on to things quite as, mm -hmm. as tightly, you know, and to be more generous. I think we're at the point now, though, we, we're getting involved in, in some of these things with the, uh, the Dream Team, some of the other uh, items that we're being challenged with that now. You know, I love doing that, uh, so I find it as one of my passions and mm -hmm. also as an opportunity to increase giving. I think the thought process for me would be to, um, to not stop where we are. Don't, don't stop with what we do, what we've done since we've been married um, with tithing is, is to go beyond that and to be stretched. God is challenging us to trust Him 
Trust me, and I will open up. Yeah. And that's what, you know, something that I learned here. Uh, to trust him, and, and not only on, on, uh, in, in past messages that you brought in, trust God, you know, with your finances. And, and it has been, it's not, not it's been an easy concept us. for yeah. me. It's not you even know, it, you know, So my wife says, Fred, just trust him, you know. And that is when I, so I'm trusting God. God, I'm going to, I'm not, you know, I'm just going to trust you with my finances because you know best where they need to go. I, th I think it's important for us to also share, like, to have this generosity con um, conversation because a lot of people don't, don't have it. So if those of us who are um, being generous or, or working toward that generosity, um, if people get the chance to hear our stories or, or to actually touch somebody who is doing it and actually say, oh, so you're still, you're still able to do X, Y, and Z and you, you're generous? Yes. Yeah, but it's, and let them know it's not us. It's not even about us. It's, it's about God. So take the card. That's my, that's my challenge to you. Take the card and ask God, you know, what do you want me to do? You're, you're going to hear things like give to, give to me so I'm first, give so you feel it and Give the tithe, and I hope that you will. In fact, I triple dog dare you. Let's pray. God, thank you for the grace of Jesus that's given to each of us. We pray for even more of his grace in our life, for his healing and his help and his hope. We thank you for this church through which we've experienced so much of your love and learning. Now I pray that you'll help us to do our part to respond to your grace and love in, in like kind. Help us, grow us, and lead us, and then do great things through our church together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.